Hi everyone, this is Howard. Welcome to the STR webinar. I'm going to have Brent start today. Okay. Okay, I yep. hope, hope you can screen. see my okay. screen. Yep, great. great. So a few cases this weekend. Um, one of the uh, cases here is, um, actually I, I was hoping that, I guess uh, David is not on this week, but I'll, I'll show another case of this in uh, a couple more weeks. But um, this is a case of a watchman device um, on CT, and um, you can see here it's a um, left atrial appendage occlusion device uh, designed to help um, eliminate the risk of, or lessen the risk of stroke uh, from embolization within the left atrial appendage, especially in patients who have atrial fibrillation um, and who are prone to developing thrombus in the left atrial appendage. And you can see that it, it sits um, in the atrial appendage and it looks like a little uh, lunar lander um, on um, both the uh, CT kind of in, and on the chest radiograph. And I actually, I, the chest radiograph of this patient didn't come through today for some reason, so I'll, I'll bring that some other time. Uh, but it sits right there and theoretically it should, um, you know, over time it should eliminate uh, the chance of, of thrombi or lessen the chance of thrombi from uh, forming and embolizing. Now, um, in the first uh, few days or even weeks, sometimes you can see a little bit of transit of um, contrast uh, within this. And the theory is that things with a very low molecular weight can um, get through, uh, but theoretically clot should not be able to uh, go backwards from the atrial appendage um, into the rest of the left atrium. Um, th this in, this in study in particular was done for question of the seating of the device. And um, you can see that on this, I did a uh, both a gated early phase um, arterial phase CT here, where you can see that um, the only thing you see here is perhaps a little bit of blush here on the um, left atrial appendage side of the device. But one other thing that they look for and we look for is um, that there's no clot on the atrial side of the device. And because if there is, then obviously it can embolize. Um, but there doesn't seem to be. But I, I did a um, delayed phase through this as well. And let me show you that that delayed phase. It kind of raises a little bit of a dilemma here in this case, because this is a patient who is about, I believe, 30 days after the device placement. I'll show you the on delayed phase here. Let me center this a little bit better. You can see that, um, I think you'd see that there's some enhancement within that um, left atrial appendage. And, um, you know, the fact that we see it on the delay and not really as much on the, um, on the early, early arterial phase contrast, and the fact that the um, device seems well seated uh, would suggest that it, it may uh, not be leaking um, as much as just still porous uh, from, um, you know, the intrinsic characteristics of the of the watchman. Um, and, and going back and looking at some of the literature on this, uh, there's some strikingly high percentages that are quoted of enhancement within these, um, you know, at least uh, 30 days after placement. And I think one study said that maybe 50% of these showed some um, evidence of, of contrast on the atrial appendage side of the watchman. Um, so presumably this is still eliminating some of the chance of clot from embolizing, but it does show some enhancement there. So that's just an interesting case of a watchman that I had there. Have, have other people seen, seen this phenomenon? No, we've, I've only seen one or two and we haven't imaged them at all after placement. So perhaps there's a little bit of contrast of pacified blood that's getting through the device into the somewhat slightly patent uh, atrial appendage. Right, right. And, um, you know, I think the, the theory on these is that it may prevent, um, you know, although you may see that um, it may, it you know, should prevent the clot from embolizing yes. uh, because it, catch, it would catch it. Right, right. Um, Okay. The other thing, we, yeah, yeah. All right, and uh, let me let me show another case here. This is a case of a. Uh, let me make sure that I'm showing the right screen here. Oops. <laughs> Let's 
Sorry about that. All right. This is a uh, patient who came in in shock, and it's unclear exactly what the source of the shock was. Um, the patient had been experiencing for a couple of days some low abdominal pain, and then actually went into, um, shortly thereafter, went into um, multi-organ um, failure. And um, this is interesting in the sense that, um, let me show you the IVC here. And of course, the IVC uh, is a slit, which you would expect. Um, but I'll show you also the left atrium. The left atrium here uh, actually looks like it is flat. It's a bit flat. It's a bit compressed here. Um, or showing that its volume is, is decreased, which is something that um, you don't see as, as often um, and would indicate that this, this person might be in um, some severe um, problems, some hypovolemic problems. And you can see in the upper abdomen, this is the really interesting thing of this case, the aorta is actually um, looks a bit flattened here at the level of the hiatus and um, behind the, the cruise of the diaphragm. You can also see that the celiac is, is showing evidence of hypoperfusion. Uh, it's very, very small and, and really not enhancing very well. And then look at the SMA. Um, the SMA and, and its um, mid you know, to distal branches here are really small and not perfusing very well. Um, the bowel shows some thickening and some mucosal hyperenhancement, uh, some straining around it that would suggest some shock bowel. And the kidneys show a really bad sort of um, hazy pattern enhancement, uh, loss of corticomedullary differentiation. Um, so I thought this was a really, um, really good case of shock that presumably is so severe uh, that it's involving you know the arterial side uh, as well in the aorta. This patient had had a ST elevation MI. They did a calf. Um, and presumably the ST elevation MI was due to hypoperfusion because um, no culprit lesions were found on the cath, and um, there was some evidence of just general hypoperfusion at cath. So presumably this was a um, case of, of some sort of sepsis that uh, we still don't know the answer. We may have it um, because this patient actually unfortunately died, um, but just a really good case of shock here. So, and, and I'm curious if... Uh, I, I can't remember having seen in, in these cases of shock um, the aorta just right at the the cruis. Um, maybe this is a place to look for this phenomenon of you know aortic uh, partial collapse. Hmm. And this is never really the thought. exam of the abdomen, right? Not to chest per se. Oh, sorry. What's that? Was this an imaging exam of the abdomen, not the chest per se? Uh, yeah, yes, this was chest and um, this was abdomen pelvis and uh, mainly a vascular study um, oh. done you know, chest abdomen pelvis for the aorta. Oh, I see. So just an interesting phenomenon there. Was the, was the aorta patent farther down? I mean, this wasn't <clears throat> aortic stenosis or something like that or aortic thrombus that no. got it's, it's perfused all the way down. That's cool. Okay. Yeah, perfused all the way down and... Really, there is no evidence of other other than the you know severe hypoperfusion of the SMA and its branches and the celiac and branches, and there was no aortic thrombus that we could see. So, anyway, and I I just have one uh, one more case here. This is sure. a uh, I don't know I don't know if Travis is on yet, but okay, well he's not. But this is a very Travis case. <laughs> Um, this is a case from Grady. Let me show you the screen here. Okay, can you see the yep. frontal radiograph? Yep. Okay, and this is from Grady, and you can see that um, projecting over the mediastinum up here is a, a nail. And, you know, when I first saw this, I thought, well, you know, could this have been a patient who swallowed a nail. Uh, this was not originally my case, but could this patient have swallowed the nail? I was thinking and looking at the funnel. Um, but look at the look at the lateral, and let me move that into position. You can see that the nail comes in like this, and the tip is right here. And so this can't be outside the patient. And I'll withhold the history here for a second, but let me show you the, uh, the CT here. Whoops, okay. Here's the CT of this case. And you can see that 
the nail comes in from the front, goes right through the sternum, goes through the anterior mediastinum, and then goes into the aorta. Goes into the aorta, the ascent, distal ascending and proximal arch there. You can see that there's a little bit of stranding um, in the mediastinum around the aorta, but um, really no extravasation of arterial uh, contrast here. Um, but just a dramatic example, um, the history here that I'm withholding is that this is a young patient in his early 20s who is working um, and at work, a nail gun um, fell backwards onto his chest and fired uh, upon hitting his chest. And the nail immediately went right through the sternum and, and right through into the aorta. Um, and he obviously had to have emergent surgery and um, uh, that was uh, done um, late, um, you know, yesterday. I don't have the results of that surgery yet, but uh, just a dramatic example of a nail gun misfiring and, and, and causing us this, this traumatic um, aortic uh, episode here. Has anyone else seen that? <laughs> I, I have seen people hit with, uh, with nails from a nail gun. I saw one at Duke in the old days. It's truly amazing. Here's a sagittal. So I just, and the, the most remarkable thing to me is that there was only some quote unquote mild chest discomfort from this. So I just, can't imagine what that must be like. Went through the maneuvering, actually. So, mm -hmm. wow. but anyway, that's all. That's all the cases I have this week. Great, that's pretty cool. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, let's see if um, Seth is still on. I'm not sure that he is. I think he may have been earlier. So. David, do you have any cases this week? I could show a couple of cases. Great. There you go. Okay. Can people see a chest Rentgen gram? Good. Yep. Okay. So this um, this fellow has a cardiac history. He's a young man. He's got pediatric sternomyelitis in place. I'm not sure what the current occasion is, but he came in in heart failure, and you can see that he has diffuse lung edema. He has a normal heart size. He is, has bilateral pearl effusion, so he has both right and left heart failure. Um, he had a placement of a right-sided impella. So here's the impella coming from inferior vena cava, right atrium across tricuspid valve, and then outflow tract with the tip pointing into the left pulmonary or proximal left pulmonary artery and I don't how don't know how foreshortened it is the, the fact that the wall looks particularly dense here suggests that this tube is actually heading away from us and is longer than we think here it's being foreshortened in this projection yep so I think it heads more substantially into left pulmonary artery than we're aware yes and at this point you can see that his generalized edema has decreased I first thought must be aspiration or pneumonia because edema, if it's going to be one-sided, is almost always on the right rather than the left. Then I realized that with the action of the impella here, propelling blood selectively into the left pulmonary artery, this indeed is most likely edema. So a little extra physiology here with this pump in place here, selectively pushing blood into the left lung, we can have selective left lung edema. It took me a couple days to tumble to that occurrence here. Um, so, Howard, I thought you would like the hemodynamics of this, which was partly yeah. the hand of God, but partly the hand of man. Oh. <laughs> so you think there's enough of a, what, I don't know, what do you call it, a pressure head or a bolus effect? So that Jet, the basically. output goes to the, to the left lung in this situation? Right, because the straight shot of the main pulmonary artery is the left pulmonary artery. You know, the right comes off at an angle. Yeah. And this is directed so it the left. So it's a little bit like the situation of um, pulmonic stenosis with the jet being directed toward the main pulmonary artery and its continuation, the left pulmonary artery. I've seen cases of valvular pulmonic stenosis like that that have selective left lung edema, again, because the jet is directed selectively to the left. That's an interesting thought. You know, we've, I haven't seen many cases of this in general. So. 
Yeah, I think um, it would be nice to have a lateral and see how far this is going toward the left PA. The fact that it crosses the bronchus indicates that it's above the pulmonic valve. And I think it's, uh, you know, the left pulmonary artery is going over the left bronchus at this point. So I think it's probably actually heading away from us into the left PA more than we could appreciate. We have a lateral view, see that better. That is interesting. Okay. David, is there, David, is there a little bit of angulation of the distal tip of that? Or I think I think there is. Um, you know, I haven't seen that many of the right-sided devices to know what this is doing. But you see, that's actually getting out into the left lung here because it's it's outside the mediastinal edge at this point. So I think that that's a further indication that this has gone substantially into the left pulmonary artery. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I think it's headed away from us here partly. So it looks kinked, but I, I think it's actually straighter if we could see our on lateral view. Yeah, that okay. makes sense. Okay, so um, let me show you this case of a, um, a woman with um, this upper lung consolidation consisting of small nodules, probably some scarring and tethering of the hyla here. And this turns out to be uh, tuberculosis. Another finding that's easy to blow by is this convexity here in her chest wall down here, this bulge. And on CT, she has pretty advanced pulmonary tuberculosis here with very nice small airways tree and bud pattern in upper lungs. And then as we come farther down, there is this lesion here involving pleura and chest wall and abscess formation here, including this outside the rib cage here, a big cold abscess here, uh, which drained uh, tuberculosis. So this is TB with this empyema necessitans sort of thing. So I used to think that necessitans meant that you had actually had to have a draining fistula, but people seem to apply the term to anything that could form a fistula, basically uh, chest wall infection that could rupture doesn't actually have to have the rupture to be called necessitans, at least in the modern usage of this. So tuberculosis with a big chest wall uh, cold abscess. So we think the process started in the pleura or close to the pleura and then just progressed outward, huh? That's what I would imagine, although it's possible that it was, you know, hematogenous dissemination to bone. We just don't see the bone destruction to go with that. It seems to be yeah. working its way around the bone rather than originating within bone and bursting out. Do you know whether her clinical presentation was related to that pain in that area as opposed to the lungs on this particular occasion? I'm just I'll, have to I'll have to check the history, too. Yeah. Uh, just curious. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Okay, and then here's, here's a fellow with an interesting chest radiograph that I saw recently, and I had seen this fellow a few years before, and these are the few years before. Because I, you know, I was looking at the at this plain radiograph here, and I thought I was seeing this lucency here with a white rim around. I thought, is this a paramediastinal bulla on one side? I looked on the lateral view and didn't see any bullae, but um, he does have a pectus um, carinatum here deformity, and he's got these strange-looking vertebral bodies. So. Um, he, um, let's see if I can go to the next one here. We call those bone in bone? Are those a bone in bone? I would call that bone in bone, yeah. So um, here is the CT scan. And this, the, uh, he turns out not to have paramediastinal bullae there, but he's got this sternal abnormality here. He's got bone in bone in his sternum here. So let me give you a, um, a soft tissue window here, sorry, a bone window. So you can see sternum within sternum at this level, and that was the cause of that ring lucency. It was really in the sternum. And then his vertebral bodies have the same phenomenon, and that's better shown here on the sagittal reformatting. So here's bone in bone on the sagittal reformatting of his uh, vertebral bodies and on the coronal as well, you can see bone in bone. Yeah. This young man had a history of childhood leukemia. I think it hit him when he was about seven. He had several rounds of chemotherapy, eventually had a bone marrow transplant, had other rounds of therapy and total body radiation because of testicular recurrence and bone marrow recurrence. 
got a transplant eventually. And um, so he had a lot of therapy. And so I think that accounts for growth arrest here. And then when growth resumed, he basically formed vertebral bodies around the existing sort of arrested vertebral bodies. And that's how we got the bone within bone. So this is the most dramatic case I've seen of bone in bone, and it's wow. broke the skin. Wow. Okay, those are the three cases I wanted to show. That's great. Thank you. Great. All right, let's see if um, anyone else is on. Otherwise, I can show some. This must be a school vacation week. Is that what's going on? Uh, much? No, I don't think so. Folks in Augusta. From Augusta, uh, I can show two cases. Okay, I will. Do that for you. You should see a little dialog box coming up for you to click on. Okay. Good. We saw you. Okay, there you go. So this is, I hope you're seeing the screen which is anonymized. Okay. okay. Uh, two cases, case number one, uh, both are similar. Uh, first case um, is a 55 year old. This uh, first CT is from 2009. Um, Initially, when this CT was seen, uh, what was thought of um, was the lesion in this area is external and impinging into the pulmonary artery. And I will show it in, um, and this was probably before we had a very good uh, PAC system at that time and patient went on to get PET CT and few other um, extra testing. And I will show you how this uh, patient looks um, about five years later. So, so this is the sequelae of a chronic uh, thromboembolytic pulmonary embolism. So very calcified right main pulmonary artery, um, then mosaic perfusion and corkscrewing um, of the peripheral vessels and intercostal vessels. Um, and I did not know too much about a sign which I've been reading more, at, they call it egg on banana sign. If you see a vessel which is very big next to the aortic arch, so very, and also um, um, bronchial changes, which I not appreciated in a uh, long time. So you do start seeing uh, the bronchus getting dilated with time. Um, so these are some of the changes of chronic uh, thromboembolytic pulmonary embolism. And uh, the second case is also similar. Um, This is a younger 22 year old, and this also x-rays from 2009. So when you see this with respect to the right side, the right lung has already become smaller. Um, and patient did get a CT scan about a month after the chest x-ray. Uh, she didn't get a chest x-ray at the same time. Um, and uh, patient got a, this was from these uh, studies are some of them are from 2009. So another case where the pulmonary artery is um, um, calcified, and one of the main causes of calcified pulmonary artery is chronic severe pulmonary hypertension. Uh, and again, this patient also has mosaic perfusion with increased um, uh, peripheral systemic uh, shunting. Uh, trying to compensate for the decreased pulmonary artery perfusion. 
And I think the bronchial changes are better seen uh, in this patient than the first patient. Um, so these were two cases which I thought will be interesting for the residents. Can you show the mediastinal window again? Are those calcifications related to that right pulmonary artery or next to it? Are they clearly... Um, I can show you in the coronal or sag plane. Can you show us maybe okay. axial again, but just make it a little bit bigger? Okay. Uh... And scroll through a little bit slower. Okay. Um, provisionally, I'm not sure I agree for sure, because what I see so far, and others can mm. chip in, but I think I see that right pulmonary artery being very small and almost imperceptible, and the calcifications okay. in tissue may be adjacent to it, and the tissue okay. compressing it rather than the okay, calcification. So causing... Yeah, so there's compression and tissue, I think, from without. And okay. I'm starting to wonder if there is a granulomatous calcific process and that the lung finding so, may be related to that. There is one more uh, finding. They had done a high-res CT at one time. Um, it's kind of hard to... Uh, some of it, like you said, could be outside. But I will look into the chart and see if they have found anything more on this patient. Um, yeah, maybe spend some time looking at the images and, and try to decide if if the that right pulmonary artery is narrowed from without by a, a calcifying process of some kind. And maybe the lung sure. findings might be related to that because that looks odd to me. Okay, I will look into it and let you know. Sure. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, We've got a couple cases here. I have a potpourri of stuff. Let me show you some arbitrarily. Let me show you this one because the context here is pulmonary hypertension, and thanks to Leif Jensen for showing me this case. So the chest radiograph itself is kind of interesting, and um, I'll just give you a moment to, to look at the pulmonary arteries and see what you think of them, both in terms of caliber as well as how they branch and the caliber of the pulmonary arteries in the lungs. So, of course, these are large, but certainly the pulmonary vessels in the lungs are very abnormal, particularly down here. They're small, hard to see, perhaps in other areas as well. So the pulmonary artery is very abnormal, big centrally, but very attenuated in the periphery of the lungs. Let me show you, just for fun, before I even show you the... mediastinal windows show you the very irregular vessels in the lung, severe perfusion abnormalities, so a very inhomogeneous perfusion of the lung that goes along with the chest radiograph. So we have a very abnormal pattern of increased pulmonary vascular resistances, but also a pattern of mosaic attenuation that's very extreme. So you can see where the blood's going and where the blood isn't going. Here is the CT showing you the findings of chronic pulmonary thromboembolism. And you can see there's a lot of clot, particularly in the right pulmonary artery and extending peripherally. So those findings we certainly have seen before and we're used to seeing. What's really interesting in this case that uh, Leif showed me is that there is clearly one vein here that is passing from the brachiocephalic vein 
and you'll see that there is a vein that enters the pulmonary vein right there. So we've certainly seen that phenomenon in cases of central venous obstruction on many occasions, and that's well described. But I presume in this person, because of the level of pulmonary hypertension, and maybe just at random, there is a vessel like this, a systemic one, that actually drains into the pulmonary vein. And we see bronchial arteries that are hypertrophied. And Leif also wondered whether some of these small veins here on the right side, adjacent to the SVC, ultimately also drain perhaps into a pulmonary vein, maybe the right inferior pulmonary vein. But that's, that's a bit hard to see. So I'm not sure that I've seen this phenomenon before. I do remember Jeff showing us a case of a patient with severe pulmonary hypertension. I, couldn't, I don't remember the cause, but in that patient that Jeff showed us, there were many veins and a whole bunch of them drained into pulmonary veins on both sides. Um, it wasn't a case of CTEF. I can't remember what the, what the etiology of the pulmonary hypertension was in that case. Were the <clears throat> Howard were, were the um, pulmonary veins small on the left? They're definitely small on the right. Pulmonary they small? Veins, so area here. That's, that's pretty normal caliber up there, isn't it? Let's go down to the inferior. It looks all right. So the inferior on the right is pretty much, um, you know, oh, very small yeah. because. It, because there's so little arterial perfusion. Yes, there's so little blood flow going through that lobe at the moment. Yeah, yeah. And if you follow, if you follow the cava down, you see that the the inferior vena cava is dilated, and the hepatic veins are very dilated. Yep. And uh, so it's probably systemic venous hypertension here. So venous pressures are high. Yes. And that's why that that's why that left superior intercostal vein is under high pressure and is able to, you know, back shoot blood back into the left atrium. I think. So just by random chance, because the pressures are high, that vein actually opens up and the communication yeah. between that vein and the pulmonary vein just opens up in this patient for no particular reason, but that just, just a matter of pressure. Pressure, and it, there's a nice gradient, and you could see it was shooting back into the left atrium. That was, uh, that was pretty nice. Yeah, right there. Right. I yeah. can provide a little bit of context, too, because the pulmonary fellow who came and talked to me about this case before we did it, uh, this patient had had an echo. Oh, yeah. On the echo with bubbles, they had noted both an early shunt and a smaller late shunt. And that's why I thought that venous filling was probably the early shunt because just after the injection, venous injection, it would have made its way to the left atrium. Right. Yeah, that is interesting. And then I almost forgot, but I think we wondered also whether, and we know that you can get systemic arteries feeding the lung in CTEF. We wondered whether there was some small arteries that came off near the celiac axis that were actually going through the diaphragm to feed the right lower lung to provide it with blood flow. And that's likely happening because this portion of the lung here is particularly affected and needs blood flow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we did wonder about that too. Yeah. Interesting. Let's see yeah. if the MIPS looks interesting. So here's the MIPS. So we see we see that. We see the nice jet there. We see the bronchioles that are hypertrophied. We see the other vessels. And then down here in the abdomen, I think we can see vessels coming off, heading to the diaphragm, and presumably at some point somewhere here, right there perhaps, penetrating into the lung potentially. Mm -hmm. Right there. Yeah. Okay. Howard, Howard, is this is this kind of a variant that that vein of a uh, levoatrial cardinal vein that oh, is? I just assumed this is the left superior intercostal vein. Didn't give it another thought. Let's look again and see if that is the case. This one that you're referring to up here. Uh, yes, the on the it, left there. Uh, that's connecting with cephalic goes down across the A order. Or, a, because or a, a tributary of it, or? Well, it, it's probably derived from it. It's embryologically, the LSIV does come from the cardinal, right. cardinal vein. Okay. Straight. 
But um, so this is a normal distribution of the left superior intercostal vein. It just happened to uh, now connect with a pulmonary vein. Because down here, this, this vein typically communicates with the accessory hemiazygous, if I remember correctly. Maybe right. the tributary vein that's opened up here and kept on going adjacent to the aorta like that mm -hmm. and eventually draining into the pulmonary vein like that. Something like that. Yep. yep. Good. Uh, this is a cute case. It makes a nice chest radiograph and it makes sense when we have everything together. So here is a frontal and lateral projection. And let me just zoom up to the area of some interest right over here. So take a look at this thin curvilinear thing. And then I'll zoom up on this side so you can get an idea of where that thing is again. So you can see that this is an object that has entered the azygous vein, the azygous arch. Anatomically, it fits very nicely. And you can see, too, where it's coming from. It's coming from this vertebra, so vertebroplasty procedure. So at the time of the procedure, some of the contrast medium entered the azygous vein. And I don't know how sticky this is, but this little worm is just sitting there subsequently having made its way there during the performance of that procedure. So there it is. It looks just like a catheter almost. And it's uh, vertebroplasty uh, cement. I forget, is it methyl methacrylate or some kind of stuff like that? So Howard, you don't think that's a catheter itself that got stuck and they couldn't withdraw it? Nope. Nope. I've got um, images that I could actually had from the procedure itself when they did the procedure. Let's see if it's the sequence. And I had a sequence from the vertebroplasty procedure. And I could see the it coming out. So that's intra-procedural during the performance of it. And there was at least one image right here by that during the procedure, huh. coming out like a little worm. So right at the time of the procedure, some got into the azygous, right there. Yep. Wow. And it wasn't there prior to the procedure, but just after, I believe. Yeah, but I'm pretty sure that that is the case. Let's see, uh, yeah. that's February. Yeah. This is just um, an interesting case of the use of one valve to deal with a stenosis of a bioprosthetic valve. So this patient has a aortic bioprosthesis. Aortic stenosis developed in relation to it. And instead of replacing the valve, they decided to put this item in it. So this is a core valve, which we've seen before. This is a new version of the Medronic core valve. It's got a, a different caliber, I think. So it's called um, Evolute R. And I think it's a smaller French caliber. So they used this to put that and deal with the stenosis that way. So here's an intraprocedural imaging showing the placement of that Evolute core valve in this valve to correct an aortic stenosis that was present. So a valve in valve procedure using that device. And as you know, sometimes these are really hard to see on post-operative radiography, bedside radiography afterwards. So valve in valve, we've seen that quite a bit. They seem to be doing all kinds of procedures like that now. Uh, this is an interesting patient because when I first saw, I didn't really know anything about it and didn't really know what was going on. So I'm going to show you the chest radiograph is from February of last year. And there's nothing really interesting about it. There may be some ill-defined opacities. But let me show you the CT from October. 
And this was kind of presented in the context of an interstitial lung disease discussion conference. And you can see the nature of the opacities and where they are. And I was pretty convinced that it wasn't any kind of usual fibrosing lung disorder. It's not sarcoidosis. And I kind of had a feel that it, it wasn't a bunch of things, but I wasn't really sure what it was. There is some mild lymph node enlargement. Well, maybe a little in the mediastinum. But um, I'm not sure what prompted me to think that in the context of the discussion, maybe I had a, a history or an inkling that the patient had had infections before and suggested that if the person really had had a history of repeated infections, and when you get these ill-defined nodular, patchy, ground glass opacities, that it may be a granulomatous thing, but particularly GLILD. So in granulomatous lymphocytic interstitial lung disease in the context of CVID, you can get all kinds of opacities. And we've shown quite a few cases of GLILD. And sometimes they look mostly like this where they're consolidative opacities that are very striking. Other times they're smaller and more nodular. This one is a combination of the two. So I suggested that this may be that and really got lucky. So sure enough, there's the history. And then you can see the profound hypogammaglobulinemia. So she's a lady that has had that history for quite a long time and finally got diagnosed with GLILD and CVID, profound hypogammaglobulinemia. Those numbers are very low. So got a little bit lucky there, but that was kind of nice. Hmm. I think that's a great explanation given the hypogammaglobulinemia and the history. I don't have a biopsy proof, but I think in putting it all together, this is very likely what it is. All right. This one is one we've certainly seen before. Um, this person had, I'm not sure what her primary symptoms were, but certainly chest pain and, and dyspnea was part of the presentation. And this is the kind of thing that one can easily go by. So I'll give you a moment to look at the chest radiograph. I can't recall whether the observation was made on the chest radiograph or subsequently as I'll show you on CT. Let me start to zoom in to the area of interest, which is right in there. So looking at the trachea, there is something wrong. It looks normal in caliber there. We see it here, but at this level, if you're lucky, there's something wrong there. And indeed there is, and unfortunately this is pretty horrible. So this is a tracheal tumor. Here you get a feel for how it involves mostly the one side of the trachea. There's a large endoluminal component. It's very lobulated. It looks pretty nasty. And yes, this is an example of a adenoid cystic carcinoma in a young person, unfortunately. And there is the pet. Um, hot, but not super hot. So this is an adenoid cystic carcinoma. Unfortunately, they had a lot of trouble getting it out. I don't think they got clear margins by virtue of its location and the extent of it. But certainly from the imaging point of view, very consistent with that kind of tumor. Um, this one is a little bit curious. It's, it's not that interesting a case, but let me just show you this patient that has a diagnosis, has carried a diagnosis of, let me just remind myself, of chronic atypical mycobacterial infection for a long time. And if we look at the lungs and we look at the bronchial tree, we'll say, yes, these findings are very consistent with that diagnosis. Um, no reason to believe the diagnosis is an error. A lot of bronchial abnormality, small airways, large areas, airways, lots of material in bronchial lumens and so on. I want to show you this one because, um, let me just get the right window and so on. Let me bring up the one that was the last one we have. So the time between these two, sorry about that, is about 
about five years. And what I want to show you here is, it's just a little bit of this, but in the right middle lobe anteriorly, when I eventually get down there, you'll see those calcifications or definitely high, yeah, calcifications. And they are new. So let's go to the corresponding area back then and we'll see that those calcifications are new. Sorry about that. So let's go to the lung window and bring that up. And you'll see that those calcifications are located in a few of those dilated right middle lobe bronchi. So I think this is sort of analogous to the high attenuation mucus that we described with ABPA and patients with asthma and ABPA. I think this just happens to be a case of the same phenomenon occurring within a few bronchi in this patient with a carry diagnosis of atypical mycobacterial infection like that. Anyone ever seen that before? It's just a curiosity. You think it could be the mucus mucus that's just calcified? Because uh, I've seen mucus plugs calcify before. I was just mucus thinking, uh, yeah, chronicity. Chronicity is sort of analogous to ABPA. I'm not sure what it is about ABPA and the mucus that can calcify over time. Like that. Let's see if I have some thin cuts to bring up to show you that. That's the thought I have is that it's just a curiosity. Mm -hmm. Like that. Yeah. And then we can you can trace that into those dilated segments of bronchi like that guy, for example. Like that. Just a curiosity. I think it's the same phenomenon, probably. I've not noticed that before. Maybe it happens and one doesn't really notice it necessarily in patients with chronic MAI infection. Okay, we still have some time, so let me show you another one. Um, this is another case, thanks to Dave, who showed me this case. This is a patient that came in with um, lung edema heart failure. I don't have a lot of information about the nature of the cardiac disease, but at some point she had a CT, and I can't quite remember the context for that, but let me show you that a surprise on the CT, and here we'll have to kind of look through all the, the parenchymal findings. So let me scroll through that, and you'll see some really unusual vessels that go every which way. So for example, You'll see that, and then we'll see this guy. You'll see that in the right middle lobe. And it's kind of the case where the more you look, the more you see vessels going off in funny directions. And you see more of them there. And I will tell you that every one of these vessels can be traced back to the pulmonary veins. So they are pulmonary veins. They meander around in a very funny way, but each one of them eventually connects to a superior pulmonary vein. So they all go to the right place. And then, thanks to David and some other folks, the thing that we overlooked initially is, and this is Caney's rule, if you see a vascular abnormality, congenital thing, keep on looking because you may see airway abnormalities. So, for example, here we can see there's abnormal lobation and a fissure on this side. And the more one looked, there seemed to be somewhat unusual bronchi or at least lobation abnormalities or accessory fissures or a combination thereof. So I'm just showing this as, a, as an unusual case of meandering pulmonary veins, but also some unusual airway findings, all just congenital and uh, curiosity in a patient that happens to have this lung edema as well. Hmm. Very interesting. Do you remember that, David? Uh, I think you, you, yeah. you picked up those unusual. So, uh, Howard, do, you know, some of these meandering veins, they look as if they have more than one central connection, as if they start from a superior pulmonary vein, they loop through the lung, and they end up plugging into an inferior pulmonary vein on the same side. It's, have you seen that as yeah, well? I'm not sure. Let's see. I mean, look at the veins here. There's like one, two, three, yeah, three at least. Four. Four veins sort of going in there, mm -hmm. maybe just one, something like that. So here's the superior pulmonary vein, and then there's four over there. 
coming together, but four there, and then this one taking a long course and going into the right place and so on. Sorry, was that your question? So, um, but you've not seen more than one central connection of any of these veins, because I, I think I've seen that a couple of times where the, the vein connects from a superior to an inferior pulmonary vein after looping oh, through the From like superior to inferior in the lung? Uh-huh. Making like arcades, yeah, right. I don't know that that actually is the case here. Okay. As such, they just seem to be fat and meander around. Cool. With is, the, uh, is, is the left pulmonary artery going over its bronchus, or is it is it trying to be a right lung mirror image? A sagittal view would be cool for left pulmonary artery going over its. So here it's going over. Let's see, do I have the right thing? The left goes over that bronchus. Can you um can you turn this into a sagittal? Can you oh, yeah. oh yeah, I'll give you a sagittal from somehow. Oh yeah. I'm just trying to find my sagittal. Yeah, I'm gonna make I'll make you a sagittal. I thought I had one, but maybe I don't. So let's see left side, stomach, and let's do that. There was a little glitch there, just when it was about to go over the left bronchus. Does it actually go over? It does not. So, and we're, we're sure we're on the left side here, correct? Let me see. Yeah. Let me. Because there's, there's, yeah, on the right. and there's no liver. So I think it's trying to be a right lung. Uh, the left pulmonary artery does not go over the left bronchus. Mm -hmm. So this is the right lung pattern, mirror image. Hmm. Yeah, so that's, 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 uh, that's why there was a minor fissure on the left. Because it's a case of right isomerism. Perhaps, yeah. Yeah. So Kenny, Kenny's rule is keep looking. <laughs> yeah. Here it's almost like there's a nubbin of bronchus there. I don't know what to make of that, but it's curious. All right, just a curiosity, vascular, airway, patient's got other problems. <laughs> All right, nice. everyone, I think that's it for the week. Anyone else have any cases in the last minute or so? Otherwise, we'll reconvene. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye, thank you. Okay. Bye.